So let's say you're eating 150 grams of protein based on your ideal body weight. How much carbohydrate and how much fat should you be aiming for in relation to that? Yeah, um, this is a great question. It depends, number one, how metabolically healthy you are. If you are metabolically unhealthy, and that means diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Metabolic syndrome, hypertension. Overweight, yeah. obese. Exactly. Then how I would do it is I would recognize first that the way in which you dose carbohydrates matter. Anything above, let's say, between 40 and 50 grams, but we'll say 40, requires an additional insulin response. You do not want that because over 40 grams of carbohydrates now, now you're requiring your body to kick in and manage glucose through insulin. That should be a fail-safe mechanism, not what you are routinely doing. And that becomes important to understand. So the first thing that you do when you're planning a diet is understand how much protein you need mm -hmm. first. And we'll say that's one gram per pound ideal body weight. Uh, you're gonna figure out how you're going to dose it. Again, that first meal for a 150 pound person, you could do 50 grams of protein three times a day. Do you have to? No. Is it advantageous if you're thinking about skeletal muscle health? Potentially, yes. The next question comes into carbohydrates. So I do better with carbohydrates. I am very physically active. The RDA for carbohydrates is 130 grams. The average American eats 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. From a practical application is understanding that you are not going to consume more than 40 grams of carbohydrates per meal. So if you say that that's 40 grams three times a day, that's, that's perfectly fine. However, I would say if you are metabolically unhealthy, you could certainly make an argument to reduce those carbohydrates. You could also, on the other hand, make an argument if you're very physically active for every uh, hour of exercise with your heart rate over 120 beats per minute, doing moderate to vigorous activity, you could easily use between 40 and 70 grams of carbohydrates per hour. One would have to recognize that that requires activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you earn your carbohydrates. And then fat, I would say fat falls where fat falls. And I would say for your audience, you know a lower fat diet can affect testosterone levels. And so for men, I typically don't go below 100 grams of dietary fat. It's very interesting because we talk about diet in terms of percentages, but that's not very helpful because um, again, it all depends on protein intake and understanding that, you know, someone might say, well, your diet is 20% protein. Well, 20% protein on a 2000 calorie diet is gonna be different than 20% protein on a 1500 calorie diet. Right. So that's how I would do it. Dietary protein first, get that number correct. Determine if you're metabolically healthy or unhealthy. Uh, again, the minimum RDA is 130 grams, titrate up or down, and then fat should just fall where it falls. I never go out of my way to add in more fat because the essential fatty acid need is about four grams a day. Yeah, so it's pretty low. low. So in order to determine if someone's metabolically healthy, like say they don't, they don't have any of these conditions, should they go get a DEXA scan? And what should they be looking yeah. for in numbers on the DEXA scan? The DEXA scan is the best that we have right now. A CT or MRI would be more beneficial, but again, how many of our patients are gonna go get an MRI to look at muscle mass? Yeah, not. Not many. No. And CT has a risk associated with, which is radiation. An in-body is helpful, and that's a bioimpedance or a DEXA. Understanding that hydration matters, time of day matters, mm -hmm. trying to be consistent. I think that we're a bit too liberal on what we look at for body fat percentage. So if someone is 30% body fat, that's too high. I would say also 25% is likely too high. So consider yourself metabolically unhealthy at those percentages. And yes, but I would say that the evidence you know, might say, well, 24% would be considered healthy. You really have to look at the individual. I'll give you an example. For me, I am naturally a leaner individual. 24% body fat for me would be very high. Yeah. Well, and South Asians, we exactly. have uh, lower targets for waist circumference and for body fat percentage to be metabolically healthy. And so I think you have to know a little bit about your body, but certainly sort of assessing how you feel too. Yes. And here's what I would do from a number perspective. I like to see fasting insulin around five, which is low. I like to see blood sugar, depends again, if it's in the 80s or 90s, you, blood sugar will run a little bit higher if you're eating a high protein diet. And one of the reasons is believed because the red blood cells live longer. So as long as your fasting insulin level is low and your triglycerides under 100, 100 or less, 
to me, looking at that picture, that's healthy skeletal muscle. And then of course, being strong. Uh, could someone do an oral glucose tolerance test? Yes. Uh, do you necessarily, exactly, <laughs> do you necessarily need to? No. And then I will say that we don't have numbers for optimal skeletal muscle mass. We could look at appendicular skeletal muscle mass index. There's ways to look at frailty. But when it, when it comes to an optimization level, we don't have that. Yeah, we don't have optimization level for a lot of things. Also very true. Like we really don't. Like, also very and true. it's probably very individualized to some degree. You know, I mean, maybe protein not so much, but certain things that we don't have optimization levels for, it's because it's going to be individual. Yeah, and I, I'm actually really glad that you pointed that out, that dietary protein we probably vary um, less in. Although I will say, I think that there's going to be new research coming out about the gut microbiome and certain bugs being able to generate these essential amino acids, which by the way, that's extraordinary. So it's probably from increased fiber intake, right? Um, I, I would venture to guess. Yes. Fiber and also the bacteria breaking down. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah. Um, I think that we're still new to be able to say, could that mean that an individual will be able to exist on a lower protein diet? I would say probably some people, but it might be 2% of the population. But when it comes to body mass and skeletal muscle mass, it is going to be very individual. You can look at these charts, but again, my body habitus is different than yours, is different than the producers, everybody. And I think that a way to think about it is understanding where your body fat percentage is. I do think people should experiment with trying to go to the lowest body fat percentage they can while still maintaining good hormonal function. Yes, because if you go too low, right. your hormones to, are going to suffer. Right, and to just try it and see where they're at. Yeah. Um, but Clearly, we know that increase in body fat percentage increases uh, low-grade inflammation. You might see that in HSCRP, many kind of inflammatory markers, triglycerides. So understanding that healthy skeletal muscle mass, we don't have a target for it yet. But I think now with the increase in better testing, we will. Yeah. Before we move on, I want to talk about animal-based protein because there's a lot of um, I know. there's a lot it's of so pushback on that. I and know. so what in terms of animal-based protein, people hear meat is a carcinogen it's actually been labeled as a carcinogen. So what do we say to that? People would have to go back to the IR papers and actually re-examine those and understand that it's a committee. Uh, committees also have biases. And the papers in which they used, they threw out a ton of randomized control trials. They used a lot of epidemiology. And as you know, epidemiology is what we consider low quality evidence. And that all the high quality evidence that individuals have looked at, if you look at the risk ratio or relative risk, there is not an increase in uh, cancer. It probably depends on the type of animal protein you're intaking. It does, whether it's processed. Um, again, so that's another good point. So whole foods, we don't see an increase in relative risk of cancer. Uh, processing is a problem. There's some discussion about burning meats. And that can certainly be a carcinogen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But understanding that a diet that is higher in high quality protein is not a risk. So. Outside of being whole foods, what else do you consider high quality protein? Whey protein shakes. Again, because of the amino acid profile, that would be considered high, high quality proteins, dairies, egg. But, um, you know, if you were going to think about what would be a high quality protein that is processed and easy, that would be a whey protein shake, um, a casein based shake. Obviously, you would need a little bit more and the digestion of that is a little bit slower. You can also get higher levels of protein on a rice pea blend. Would that be considered high quality protein? Based on the definition, it would not. Again, because the high quality proteins have the amino acid profile very similar to human muscle. And that's what we need. We need these essential amino acids. So if something is low in essential amino acids, by definition, it would be considered a low quality protein. Collagen is actually has a protein score of zero. Yeah, I, I learned that from, from you actually. Yeah. I didn't know that. And because it's uh, very low in these branched chain amino acids and uh, devoid of tryptophan. So that has a protein score of zero. It doesn't mean it's not helpful because again, it's rich in glycine and proline, other amino acids, which do a number of other things that are highly beneficial. But from a skeletal muscle standpoint, it has no effect. What about taking branch chain amino acids? I think it's a great solution. If you are eating a lower quality uh, diet, then adding in branch, uh, branch chain amino acids could be very beneficial. So for example, if someone is uh, vegan or vegetarian, using a branched chain amino acid with a meal, I do not recommend branched chain amino acids alone because having branched chain amino acids alone is like putting a key into a car, turning on the ignition, and then trying to pe press on the gas but not having any gas in the tank. So in order to put muscle protein synthesis into effect, you need the whole spectrum of amino acids. 
Could there be a benefit of branched chain amino acids to just have? Certainly, but again, the human was not designed to be, how do I say this? We have a lot of variability and flexibility, but protein should be ingested in discrete meals. Shouldn't it be a little bit here and there? But again, skeletal muscle as a nutrient sensing organ that has been maintained over time, it gives us clues on how we should proportion our diet. And then I'm gonna kind of lump two myths together. One is that red meat has a lot of saturated fat. And the other one is that in time and time again, studies have shown that red meat correlates. Again, these are probably epidemiological, but there's, people will say, strong evidence that red meat is correlated with multitude of cancers. So, or, even, or even cholesterol. I think yes. that that's a big one. Mm -hmm. And I think it becomes really important to point out that these earlier studies didn't differentiate uh, high protein and high fat. So a lot of the data that comes out of... Um, red meat being bad for cardiovascular disease didn't account for the fact that it's a robust amount of calories and also a lot of fat. Mm -hmm. But when you look at low protein, high quality sources, we see a number of metabolic benefits, including improvement in triglycerides, improvement in blood sugar regulation, lower levels of insulin, lower levels of blood pressure. We see time and time again that a high protein diet with a moderate amount of fat has metabolic benefits. So for the audience who doesn't know, what are some good sources outside of the typical chicken and yeah. uh, that, that people can eat that are high quality proteins, moderate amount of fat, yeah. not high saturated fat that people can consume? Yep. And also, I do want to finish up with a, a cancer question because I know that people are concerned about that. Yeah. So I'm going to answer, finish that, and then I'm going to come back to the, the sources. When you think about cancer, you have to think, what kind of cancer are we talking about? Are you talking about prostate cancer? Are you talking about breast cancer, uterine cancer, whatever it is, lung cancer? So I think that understanding what kind of cancer we're talking about and understanding what are the actual risks that we know. Smoking and lung cancer, we know. Um, obesity and cancer, we know. Very clear, yep. These are clear, there's mechanisms. When people say red meat and cancer, you have to give me a mechanism. What is that mechanism? Well, people would argue it's inflammatory. And I absolutely hear that. My question would be, we actually haven't seen that with high quality studies, high sources of protein that are low in fat and whole foods, we don't see an increase in inflammation. And I think that that becomes really important to point out. The other thing with, let's say, colon cancer, one would have to ask, where's the fiber in the diet? What are the things that we know? But again, Dietary protein, and especially red meat, has been the scapegoat for things for decades. Things like obesity, lack of fiber intake. Right. Um, These those... things that we know there's a relative risk that is much higher than, and they've done the study. So dietary protein or red meat and cancer has a relative risk of 1.2. And we know that uh, in order for something to be meaningful, uh, just to put this into perspective, smoking and cancer would have a relative risk of 12. Anything above two would be considered clinically significant, or I'm sorry, statistically significant. We don't see that with red meat and cancer. So I, I just think that that's really important to point out because the conversation is complex. And I think that we all wanna age well. And I think that when you think about the big killers, you think about cancer, you think about heart disease, um, you think about infection, you think about falls, kidney disease. The CDC will list these diseases. But at the core, you will never see muscle mass, a decreased muscle mass on that list, and or obesity on that list. And I think it's just understanding that these big killers all have a metabolic component. And when you go back to the metabolic component, obesity is pathology and skeletal muscle is a solution. So how do we design a diet that is going to help support a lean body mass and prevent a known carcinogen like obesity. I think what's helpful also in terms of why it's so high quality is also the amount you'd have to eat yeah. of, let's say, tofu, for example, compared to chicken. Or six cups of quinoa yeah. to equal one small chicken breast. That becomes really important because we have to think about, um, so the limiting amino acids are lysine, methionine, and leucine. And leucine is what is necessary for muscle health. Now, each of these amino acids are limiting in different 
in different areas. So for example, a vegan diet is largely a methionine restricted diet. That could be positive, it could be negative, but understanding um, when we think about skeletal muscle health, we have to recognize that it is not just the overall protein intake, but it is the individual amino acids. And then one step further is focusing on just protein is very myopic. There are nutrients of need that are declining in the American diet. For example, iron. For example, zinc, selenium, B vitamins. These all ride along with high quality proteins. And this comes back to this idea of what you said, um, the amount that you would have to consume. So what you're talking about is nutrient density. How do we pick foods as we age? Typically we eat less. How do we pick foods that will allow us to get the most amount of nutrition with the least amount of calories? And that would be very clearly things like whey protein or lean red meats. And I'll also say that you could be vegetarian or vegan and still be healthy. It just takes more effort, just understanding where the deficiencies could possibly be. And also, how are you going to design a diet that supports aging where it's something you don't have to think about? We have to be able to recognize that we live in, in a dynamic world. And on, on those nutrient topics, we know that low zinc will cause issues with hormones. That's right. We know that low iron, as you mentioned earlier on our podcast, that low iron is related to female sexual dysfunction or sexual dysfunction in general, probably. And what about pregnancy? What about um, anemia for young women? I mean, there are all kinds of problems that happen when you eliminate whole food groups. Yeah. Let's give some examples of the lean red meats. Bison is very lean. Venison. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever heard of Maui Nui? Yeah, I've heard of it's it. It's amazing. Have you tried it? I haven't tried it yet. Um, well, if Matthew was paying attention, he would have sent us a lot more Maui Nui. I'm not talking about you, but um, <laughs> Maui Nui venison is amazing, regenerative, um, but lean and certified Piedmontese. If you've never had that, I'd love to send some to you. These are amazing sources of lean red meats, which are incredibly valuable and also valuable for children. That's an example. Any kind of fish, I mean, aside from some of the fatty fish, lean source of protein. Eggs have about six grams of fat per egg. So if you were having five or six eggs, that would not be considered a lean source. But dairy, low fat, Greek yogurt. I love Greek yogurt. It's incredible. Yeah. I should have offered that to you for lunch or breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but those are all sources. And there's one more thing also to mention is this has taken a very long time to die is this idea that dietary cholesterol increases overall blood cholesterol. They took cholesterol guidelines, or they took cholesterol recommendations out of the dietary guidelines in 2015. So when someone says cut ago. back, <laughs> cut back your red meat to reduce your blood level of cholesterol, that's that was taken out of the guidelines. Uh, I will also mention that shrimp has higher amounts of cholesterol. So there's um, the body tends to make a certain amount of cholesterol and. Um, you know, whether you have diet and exercise influence, but understanding that um, the body regulates these things. If you enjoyed this clip of the Rena Malik MD podcast, make sure you check out the full episode with my friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, right here.